Good. How are you? Great. I apologize for being my, my internet decided that it was going to take three minutes to launch a Zoom meeting for me today. Oh, that's okay. Awesome. Well, it looks like we have a couple people in here. Um, oh, I, we can get, we can definitely get started. So the, the whole purpose of, of this really is, is just similar to just a, a drop-in session where I will be available every Thursday within the same time window. So if anyone has a Maslow or an M2, or even if you have one of the, the Maker 300s and you just want to talk to someone and ask a question or give some feedback or something, then you know that there will always be a person that will listen and that you can talk to and interact with at this, at this time on Thursdays. So hopefully this is, becomes valuable um, for everybody that's, that's on. Um, you don't have to talk if, if you don't want to. Um, if you would rather just type your message and throw it into chat, um, you can. Uh, and same thing with uh, cameras. You, you don't have to turn your camera on. Uh, we chose Zoom as a platform because I know sometimes when people are asking um, like direct detailed questions about their machine, it may be easier to turn your camera on and, and visually show me uh, what you're talking about. Um, but there's, uh, there's no need for it unless um, you feel that it, that it helps you illustrate your question. Um, so I will go ahead and stop talking at this point and then just be ready for anyone to say anything. I guess I, I could jump in and ask a question here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, my name is Drew. I'm with, oh, founder of Canopy Labs. We're here in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we have a bunch of Maslow's. Uh, we have three now. Uh, absolutely love them. And we, we got a lot of people. So we have a lot of the maker spaces and stuff around here that are con that, that bought them, that are having trouble getting them calibrated, having trouble getting set up. And so I, we saw you start did a, um, a reseller, a partner program. Yes. And we want to see about getting signed up for that. I think we filled out the forms and all that. But uh, we were looking at helping people get their set up and get things going and stuff here, hopefully. Okay. No, absolutely. Um, Peyton uh, would probably, hopefully, be able to get you in contact with, I don't know if that's a Sarah or Patrick thing, but we can definitely get you routed to the, to the right person for, for that. Yeah, it's, it's a Drew thing. Oh, awesome. Drew thing. There we yeah. go. <laughs> hey um drew if you want to if you want to chat your email okay. i'll send it directly to drew perfect thank you yeah because um uh, hey, hey dale's oh, my, so we uh dale's my co-founder and so but yeah we definitely want to get the program and i'd say we didn't know what kind of resources and other things would be available to y'all's partner program and what y'all would be what what that entails or if you'll have more documentation on it because on the website we just saw it's a little bit like pre program not a whole lot. yeah it's pretty new so mm -hmm. i'm not sure what all what all information drew has because we haven't even had a team meeting about it mm -hmm. um but it's definitely started and i will get you directly in contact with him yeah because we, we can move a lot of them we have a lot of people that also have we have a pretty large social media following so perfect i just got your chat Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm going to send you Dale's too, just so you have that. Uh, For, yeah, do that. It. No problem. And along those, uh, along, mm, why is my camera not working? Okay, along those points, um, I've noticed that the instructions tend to um, not necessarily leave stuff out, but kind of leave things to assumption that certain steps or processes are done what's the best way to contribute back to that as well is that you know go find the github for it or something or is it or is it just hop on the forums or yeah so we have uh, we are definitely working to make our instructions better um anytime we hear feedback 
what what we found is the M2 is a product that we have uh, engineered and released under the Maker Made brand. So anything M2 related, um, the our Facebook owners group is probably going to have more uh, community information. Um, but anything pertaining to the original Maslow, the the Maslow forums also have um, have a, a lot of information. But we would ask that if, if you do get stuck and there it's something that is stemming directly from our documentation, if you could let us know so that we can not only work with you to remedy the issue, but also use that feedback to update the documentation for future users. Okay, yeah, I've gotten in, I've, I've bypassed it and you know found workarounds or you know doc self-documented the fixes so yeah i could contribute that back that'd be great awesome i really appreciate that and i'm all over that that group as well on facebook so i'm answering questions constantly in there sweet I, I, that, that's awesome that's that's what we kind of had hoped with the with the group was not so much that people like take over the support reins from us but with this being a, a kit that is just highly configure, configurable based on the user's needs, we know that more than likely there's an opportunity where another owner has either encountered the similar issue or has tried to achieve the same goal and just, just you know, trying to keep everyone's minds together and keep frustration levels down. Because I know you know, there are times where the, the machine, the kits themselves can be a little frustrating if, you know, if you don't have that many hours on them. So we're, we're, we're definitely looking uh, forward to the community expanding and, and being able to help each other along the way. Great. Awesome. I know, um, I know Brad has some questions. Or Brian, I'm sorry, Brian. I can't see. Are you? Can everyone see the people who are talking? Because I can't. There we go. Hey there. Yeah. There we go. How, How are, are you guys you? doing? Doing great. Um, I'll, I uh, I do have uh, Drew. Is, uh, Peyton was kind enough to connect me to Drew, and I do have some questions out to him. But if if uh, this is an opportunity, there aren't others that I'm taking the time from. Would love to bounce a few things off you real quick. Absolutely. Great. Um, let me see if I can figure out how to turn the camera around on this. It should be at the top, I think, Brian. Okay. If you're on your phone. Yeah, I don't usually use this on my phone, almost always. It's like a circle. Um, or like arrows pointing to each other. Oh, there we go. Just had to tap it. Okay. Um, so I, um, I I got. I'll back up for a second. Um, built out the frame. Built out the sled. Um, got everything put together. Got to the calibration step. Made a. a went through the instructions to make a file to, you know, a vector based file to do this uh, initials logo thing and, uh, and also a square. And, um, you know, was pretty pleased with the first cut. Um, the slash across it was me figuring out the Z axis, but the rest of it cut pretty close to what I expected, the logo pretty clean, but the aspect ratio, you know, a little taller than wide. So at that point, feeling pretty good. I, um, in jogging the sled over, lost track of millimeters versus inches and um, went, thought I was moving it, you know, 30 millimeters or 40 millimeters or something like that, um, or, or maybe more than that and uh, uh, didn't get to the plug in time when I realized it was going inches instead of millimeters. And so it went off the bottom of the frame and it 
it, you know, the stepper motors kept going and ripped the chains, you know, the nails and the chains out. And so that was kind of exciting. Um, but I put everything back together. Don't think I was any worse for the wear, except I had to tighten back down the, the stepper motor, stepper motor anchors up here and, um, and straighten out the nails and put them back in. But, um, when I went to go, um, when I went to go calibrate again, uh, or, or to, I found that my calibration squares were, um, the orientation was tilted. And so from right to left, these are um, some squares that I cut. And then this one down here was the last one I cut. But um, I found that, uh, I guess one question I had was, when the chain was ripped out, there there is a. It's, I'm not sure if you can really see it here, but there's a little bit of a tiny bit of torsion in the chain from just it being ripped out and pulled at an angle. I think Did stepper you motors. Are, what's that? Did you calibrate after it jumped off? I did. Yeah, I uh, I counted all the links again and um, went through the calibration process, but I got. Um, I got down to these squares and the orientation was different. And also uh, the process of putting in a, a scaler, I don't have the laptop in front of me right now. I need to go find it. But um, the process of you know putting a little X scaler, a little more or less than one uh, to calibrate didn't seem to be dialing me in the way I, I hoped. and and the orientation was still off. I, I adjusted some chain links. I'm not sure if that's the right way to go about adjusting the orientation, but um, anyways, I, I just find that the calibration doesn't appear to be dialing me in like others have talked about. Um, I, you know, this square is, oh, thank you. Um, this square is, um, probably closer than the third square, which, or the fourth square, which actually is aspect ratios off a little bit more. And I don't know if I'm doing that step wrong, but anyways, I thought I'd ask any, any watch outs from, you know, should I be, should I be concerned about the chain being? Quick, so if, the, if you have a little bit of flex in your chain, um, as long as you're not hearing any kind of binding um, as, it's, as it's going over the gear, uh, that shouldn't be anything major. However, if, if the chain is in a state where you feel that it is unsafe, um, definitely let us know and, and we can get that sorted out for you. Because uh, obviously we don't want an issue like that to lower your confidence in the machine from from a, uh, definitely from an aspect of safety. Um, so we'll, we'll make sure that you're taken care of on that. Um, now, in regards to the angled, like the rotation on those squares, yeah. usually we see that most when there is a measurement variance in mm -hmm. your calibration. So with that, when you, um, you, know, you, you said you had to re reattach um, the motor, when, when, after you put the back on there, did you remeasure the distance between, uh, between the two motors when you went through your calibration or did you reuse a lot of those measurements? Um, well, everything's anchored in exactly the same spot. So I think I did a token quick quick measure, not as precise as I was the first time, but figured nothing had moved. And since I counted out the links again um, on the chains as well, um, you know, I, that was my, my next step was probably to start all over again and do all the, put all the measurements in again. Um, but I don't believe anything, everything is, you know, screwed in, anchored down in exactly the same spots as before. So. Okay. No, no, yeah. that's fine. And uh, which version of Makerverse are you using? Are you on 1.0.6 by chance? Um, let me check. Um. Uh, 
also to, to confirm what I believe to be true, if the uh, power cord ever crosses the USB cord, that's a bad thing, right? That messes up the signal. Uh, it, it can. It was a much more prevalent issue in the original Maslow's than the M2. Um, uh -huh. But just by just genuine nature of, of electronics, it is, it is not ideal for a, a high um, you know, power cord or something to cross connection with, with a, like a USB cable, just because there's, there's only five volts going through the USB. Um, and then where, you, you know, you have like a 15 amp router or something, um, it, it, it could definitely introduce noise into a USB connection. Um, but it is, it is much noticeably more resilient than in some of the previous models. Um, a, lot of, a lot of users um, have been able to combat this by um, mounting the control box to the, to the back of the, of the system and then having their USB um, kind of like routing down to the edge of the machine and then forward to their, to their computers. Um, mm -hmm. uh, routing, running it like down and under where it's gonna come in contact with your Z axis cable and potentially some power cables and everything. Um, there is potential for that to introduce some noise into your USB connection. Gotcha, I think uh, that was the experience I was having. And I think now that I know to avoid it, I've been able to um, avoid that. That is that is one point of feedback I'd I'd give back to the instructions that was an intermittent thing that made it things seem really squirrely to me until someone on one of the um, threads said maybe that would be an issue. That might be a good thing to put in the instructions. Awesome. Yeah, we'll definitely, um, we'll get that added in there. That That's, that's very good feedback. Um, one other thing that I would ask on your squares is when you are, when you're, say you're jogging to the left and you're going to cut a square, are you rehoming your machine or are you using a work offset when you cut those? Uh, I think I've done it both ways. Um, usually when I turn it on, I home it and then I, um, you know, cut off of that home. But sometimes as I continue to cut, I set a new home. Okay. So I will say that the set home button in, in Makerverse is establishing the actual uh, Z, zero, zero position of your waste board, which in the firmware, the assumption is that is the dead center of your waste material, your waste board. Mm -hmm. uh, and so anytime you're gonna deviate from that position um, and perform a cut, uh, using the work offsets will definitely give you the best, um, the, the, the best cut possible because with the assumption that zero zero is always going to be the center of your waste board, um, all of like the triangle math that's happening has that assumption, uh, associated with it. So, uh, we, we have seen where there've been instances where people will move to like the upper right corner. And then uh -huh. they'll, they'll set home and then and then try to perform a cut in the machine just it thinks that it has more space than it really does and more yeah. chain um so and and just going into that a little bit deeper is because because a lot of it is like well why does that even make sense why does that even matter and and it, and it really just goes back to being able to calculate how much tension is on each motor and compensating uh -huh. for any additional chain slack that exists between the sled and the motor itself, because we have to compensate for that, that slack before we're actually calculating a movement of the sled. Um, so that's where, so zero, zero, they, whenever you say set home, that is just purely meant for defining the midpoint of your wasteboard. And then when you go to um, do a cut 
that needs to originate in a in a point that is not the home of the machine, um, we we definitely recommend using a work offset because that will make that will maintain the existing home of the machine and allow you to return back to that that zero zero point, and then the firmware doesn't have to do quite as much work during the cut. Okay. Um. I guess I'm trying to get myself, uh, I had to run from another meeting to this, so I, I'm trying to get myself set up with the laptop. But one of the questions that I had was, would, um, when, I, when I make a drawing and I bring it into Makerverse and it's, it's version 1.06, um, you'd asked earlier what version it was. Um, the um, when I go to tell the machine to cut something, it's confusing to me, and maybe maybe I just don't understand work offsets yet. It's confusing to me how to, uh, and, and I'm trying to recall the steps. It's been a little while. I've kind of sat on this for a couple of weeks, but the um, the when you're making the drawing. Um, the default, I think, is to show that your your cut will be up and to the right from wherever your um, your location is. And so, in order to cut in a different place from up and to the right from home, when I want to use other parts of the wood, is work offsets how I do that? So, work offsets will be based on just the machine control itself. If you want to do more of a position, a work positioning when you're creating the G code itself. Mm -hmm. um, that will be based on where you place that zero zero origin in your CAM software. Um, so, if you're using Easel, I like to use Easel as a as a good reference point just because it's it's free to use and and everyone can get on there. Yeah, that's what I'm using. Perfect. So in Easel. That, that easel was built for the X-Carve machine. And the X-Carve machine homes into the front left corner of the machine. That's where that machine zero, zero is. So the, the lower work, left? Correct. And so the workspace that you're working off of was really made for their machine. So to, to compensate for the Maslow or the M2, if you are, if you go, you can, you can do your whole design in the radial workspace as normal and then just select everything and drag it so that the middle of your artwork is now residing on that zero, zero point of their, of their workspace. So only 25% of your actual cut will be on the workspace. Everything else will be in the blue area. But then uh -huh. when, you, when you export that G code, then when you'll you'll create the G code and then when you import it into Makerverse, it will be dead on, dead center in your workspace because our zero zero is the exact middle of our machine. And so uh, the next step to make it go elsewhere is what what step should I take? Yeah. So if you are, so that's that's how you would want to do your G code creation for alignment in our in our wasteboard environment. Now, say say you have a four foot by eight foot sheet of anything, and yeah. and you say, okay, I need to cut this square out, but I want to cut it out of the upper right quadrant of this cut material instead of the dead center. Or maybe especially the lower left, since I think I know how to get to the upper right using the um, easel because that's available to. Correct. Now it's the, the lower left is not available. Hundred percent. So the other thing is by using work offsets, it will not require you to make any modifications to your G code. You'll actually be able to do all of your projects in G code using that zero zero reference point in the middle. Um, mm -hmm. And then using the work offset, you can actually place that work anywhere within your cut material that you like. And the way you use a work offset is you, you click on the home button in the jog controls, which will take your sled back to that zero, zero 
middle point of your of your waste board or your cut material and then you'll use the jog command and then you'll jog the you'll jog the bit to where it's now in the dead center of where you want your piece to be cut and then once you get there under the work offset section in the upper right of makerverse Mm -hmm. under, under the X position and Y position, there is a set work offset option. And then when you set that, you'll see that the machine position will then, the, it'll go to, it'll say, hey, I'm at zero, zero with an offset of positive 150 in the X direction and 25 in the Y direction. And then that's okay. how it tells the machine, hey, I know I'm not at zero, zero, but I'm giving you an offset. And then all it does, all that does is whenever it gets its, whenever it gets its coordinates from your G code, it's just going to add that much to the starting X and the starting Y of that cut so that it stays where you want it to be. Okay, so it is... Uh the work position column right there. Yep, that is it. And, and you won't do anything with the Z um, just because you, we're not doing anything too in, intricate where you would be doing anything um, with the, a work offset on, on Z. But with, with Y, you'll, you'll look on there that um, if you'll hover over those commands, um, I'm actually pulling up my Makerverse because I've, I've, I've learned that anytime I'm super confident, even about the thing that I made by myself, um, I will lie to you on accident. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. So if you look on the, on the work off work position right below the zero on, um, on one of those, just hover over that little map pin. And then you should see a little tool tip that pops up. I think I can only do that once. And this is another oh, yeah. thing. And it's got to be been, unlocked. It's a, it's a, you know, I haven't thought about this for a couple of weeks. And I know the first, I, you know, my, my connectivity to it seems really. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it's your port setting. You're on the Bluetooth, on the Bluetooth chip on your Mac. So hit the yeah. And then now drop, uh, doesn't seem to be seeing your. So I've got, board. I've got the, uh, and this is a, a recurrent thing that sometimes I don't see the extra option. So I've got, you know, my USB um, connection up to the box. I'm plugged in the black, you know, I've got the light down on the power supply. Um, plugged into the bottom of the um, the sled and the, the Z, mo Z motor down there. Hey, Brian, and so, and yeah. Chris, not to, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I know Dale had wanted to jump in and I, Chris, I just wanted to make sure you're seeing chats because Jesse wrote in with a long chat. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's I'll take Thank you. I'm, I'm good. I was just going to basically say what he was saying about the offsets and about zeroing x and y in your uh whatever cat or whatever if you're using illustrator inkscape or whatever like setting the office i was just going to jump in on that part but you already answered it so okay thank you appreciate that um so this is this is a continual source of frustration for me is sometimes this the arduino board shows up in the port and sometimes it doesn't and i pull it out and put it in and turn it on and turn it off and pull it out and put it in and eventually it shows up well not always there have been times when it hasn't so i can tell you that just from personal experience um that is your macbook um the for some reason the mac and the usb port management in the mac operating system is is not um as robust as some of the windows machines uh, I, I also run a, a MacBook and I encounter issues like this where I have to like completely close the application and bring it back. 
uh, we've done we've done kind of extensive testing on the application side, um, and it and it really has been um, kind of steered back to that it is a it's just a a Mac operating system um, issue with how they manage uh, the USB connection. So it's probably the power uh, management on that port. I, I don't have my Mac in front of me, or I'd walk you through it, but I'm on my Windows machine right now. But there's a um, there's a keep alive power from that Mac does with like when you close your Mac, it'll allow the port to continue to provide power. Like you can plug stuff into charge off of it. If you don't have that enabled, it'll, it'll just turn the port on and off when it thinks it's not being used. It's in your power and uh, it's been a while since I've changed it, but like, if you want to go look through there later, um, it's in there somewhere. Keep alive. Okay. So it's, it's keep the port alive. Keep, keep power to the port when, yeah, like that. okay, thank you. I'll look for that. Um, so now I think I'm connected to the USB, you know, to our Arduino, but it didn't automatically uh, run all the code that normally it will when I connect to the board. And I know there's a setting, I thought it was enable hardware flow control that enables the board to load normally but you know this is the kind of thing that makes it feel yeah like what, what am i going to get this time absolutely no and I, I i definitely understand the frustration i think what may be beneficial for your your situation is if we maybe schedule some some one-on-one -on -one where um i can get in front of one of our shop machines uh -huh. um, and then try to replicate the issues that you're seeing um, mm -hmm. just from what you're seeing with the console and everything. Yeah. Uh, there may be something wrong with your control board. And I want to make sure that um, we, we properly troubleshoot that kind of with, mm -hmm. with all of our, our um, steps that we have uh, before uh, digging too much further into the application itself. Um, okay. What I may do is get you in contact with Joel. Um, Joel is really, really good at troubleshooting those boards. And we have found some that have just kind of been bad. That's, that's kind of one of the, one of the drawbacks to electronics is, is sometimes they're, sometimes they look good on initial inspection and then they have additional little problems to them. But we have, we, you know, we have the, we have the ability to do a warranty replacement on your control board if you are, um, having issues because this this is kind of a telltale sign that you may have something wrong with okay. the control board. So I definitely want to get you with Joel um, just because that could just lead to continued frustration when it's an actual piece of faulty equipment. Uh, we, we don't want you to, you know, continue to be upset with the machine if there if there genuinely is a piece of hardware that that has something wrong with it we want to get that swapped out for you thank you and um is that also uh if i've been able to cut and it has intermittently loaded automatically and functioned is that that, 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 sign? that definitely sounds like there are that there is a potential issue with your control box only because it is that is not how it was manufactured to work. So um, if you're having intermittent connectivity issues, especially if you, if you can get the USB port stuff sorted out with the power management and you still see that issue, um, mm -hmm. then I would definitely say the next thing to investigate is a, a potential flaw in the control board itself. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Um, do we, is it, it sounds like maybe there's a handoff. Uh, Peyton was, was great to get me in contact with Drew. Is there a facilitated handoff to Joel then that? Yeah, I don't know, Peyton, if you, if you have his contact information, if you wouldn't mind getting him in, in contact with Joel, um, I don't know, or, or maybe we can do a, um, a ticket um, through Freshdesk. Um, yeah. so so that we have it have it all documented um and if you would be able to walk brian through that i'm confident that we can get him up and going pretty quickly so do we want to schedule 
a Zoom with Joel or just a just connect him? Um, just connect him. Joel has like a pretty quick rundown of questions that he can ask that will just tell him if there is an issue. Okay. Um, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll get it sorted out because I think that's really what we need to look into now uh, before we get too much deeper into doing test cuts and everything because I think I think that's going to be one of the limiting factors too. Okay, know. Ryan, yeah. I'm on it. Thank you, Peyton. I, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Hey, no problem. I, I um, is y'all still have time for another question? Yeah, I'm going to, I've got uh, Jesse queued up for the next one, um, but then we, we will definitely have time for, for some more after that, if that's okay. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, Jesse, I have your thing pulled up. I'm reading it right now. Um, oh, wow. So you're having lag in your jogging. Yeah, when I go across the top, only the, the very top. Okay. So if you're at, say, like, uh, if, if your sled is at the very top and then you move over, um, um, does it do it at the bottom or is it just only the top? It's only the top edge. And it's only the top, like, two or three inches. Okay. I, I, I wish I took a video of it before I started cutting. <laughs> oh, nice. It's awesome that you actually are cutting, though. That's it's always it, it's mesmerizing to watch the machine do its thing. I, I always tell people because we make the machine, we get to make the least cool things with ours compared to what everyone else is doing. <laughs> uh, I would say one one thing that I would do is try to see if you if you experience the same um, behavior if you were to perform a cut in that same position or and I, I do jogging. it is okay I mean I I was hoping I would catch a, a picture now I'm cutting little holes in a sheet of plastic but okay. uh but the the top holes is it even though it's only moving two inches or so between the holes, it goes over, drifts down a little, and it just goes up right at the, the very end. I mean, so, you know, a long jog, it does it. A short move, it does it. I mean, I'm, I don't okay. know. <laughs> I think what would probably be helpful for you, are you also on 1.0.6 of Makerverse? Yes. Okay. So we have a new release that we will be coming out with, um, we, it's in beta right now. We have quite a few people testing it, um, but it includes a update to the control board firmware, uh, okay. as well as a newer version of Makerverse. Um, but it is, it's doing a lot better job of compensating for that chain slack. And I mm -hmm. think that that's what you're seeing is that when you get to the top, especially when you're moving to the left and to the right, there's, you, you need pretty, pretty constant tension on both of those chains to traverse that high of the, of the cut material. Yeah. Um, so I would be interested in getting you a copy of the firmware and the new version of, of Makerverse and seeing if you still have the same issue when moving to that. Um, All right. Do, then then all of the changes that we thought fixed problems don't actually fix problems <laughs> um, and, and, and and it could highlight that maybe you have you know some underpowered motors uh, yeah. now I, I know you say left do you see it in movements of both directions yes okay perfect just wanted to just wanted to ask that question Okay, yeah, so I think uh, if you're up for it, I would love to get you on the new version of the firmware uh, as well as the, the newest uh, Makerverse version. It's, it's in a very high beta, so this isn't like a, hey, we just made this yesterday, let me know if it works kind of deal. Yeah, um, yeah. We're extremely close to a release. Um, so I, I think it might be something that would be beneficial and it would, be, it would definitely be interesting to use 
the you know the issue that you're seeing as a, a water test for some of the updates that we've done on the firmware side. I can give that a try. Perfect. I wonder uh, if the taller bar and longer chains is another solution too. I yeah, mean, I've, I'm stuck in my basement, so <laughs> that that's one thing I was wondering too. Is uh, I could I could probably lower my wasteboard and and redo that as well if if. That may fix it. Um, yeah, you you could you could definitely do that. Um, what we have though is the the new firmware and the newer version. We are seeing um, repeatable accuracy throughout the all the way. I mean, we are, we're cutting to within like three quarters of an inch of the edge of the board with the same accuracy as we're getting at the the center of the board. That's with good. The, the updated firmware. So hopefully that will be an issue. If that doesn't solve it, then I would say um, maybe increasing the distance between the top of your wasteboard and the bottom of your beam um, would be something that 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 would probably help you. Um, yeah. But we would definitely want to be cognizant of the bottom of the wasteboard at that point too and try to find the, the happy medium. Um, what is the distance? What is your motor offset right now? Oh man, it is. What value is that? Uh, should say motor. Oh, which? Uh, it'll be in the calibration widget. The M2. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That that's easier. It is four hundred and twenty-seven millimeters. Okay, so that's a lit. I mean, it's <clears throat> it's not by much. But I want to say, I want to say mine is right around like 470 millimeters. So mm -hmm. I would, you know, that would suck if 50 millimeters was, was really the defining thing there. Uh, but let's let's try the new firmware first, um, and then see. And then if not, it, it may be something where uh, lowering that wasteboard just just a smidge uh, may give you what you're looking for. Now. To anyone listening, uh, the the longer chains and extended top beam that that is that is a solution for allowing you to cut beyond the bounds of a four by eight um, sheet of material. And what what I just what I want to highlight on that is that all all CNC machines have a workspace very similar to like 3D printing and, and, and even like your inkjet printer that you print paper on is that a, the four by eight is the waste board, the workspace of the machine. And traditionally in, in CNC, that is the outer bound of your cut space. All projects have to reside within that area. So going to a 12 foot top beam and 15 foot chains is ultimately widening, broadening that workspace to where an entire four by eight sheet of plywood now fits inside of that workable area to where you could have cuts that actually go outside the edge of the four by eight to where you could have one of the straight edges of your sheet be part of your project. Um, so we, we've had questions about that, like, oh, I can't cut I can't cut the edge off and everything. And, and you'll find it's, I understand the frustration and, and I think that we could probably do better of communicating what that four by eight workspace really means. Um, but we are doing everything we can by means of firmware to get people as close to the edge of that four by eight. But with the 10 foot chains, um, there will always be a limitation that your cuts will have to reside within that four foot by eight foot platform. And if you wanted to extend beyond that as the outer bounds of your cut, that is when a 12 foot top beam and 15 foot chains would, would need to be introduced. So what I will do Jesse, I'm gonna send you a message right now in in chat. All right. I'm gonna send you my email address. And if you would just send me an email, 
I can get you set up. And what we'll probably do is have like a call, like, you know, maybe this evening or something when your cuts and everything are done. And I can get you the firmware bundle uh, as well as a, are you on Mac or Windows? Windows. Okay, so I can get you the executable for the, the updated version of, of Makerverse. Um, with that, the new version of Makerverse does bring in um, workspace tabs. Um, so in, in the instance that you had two machines, you would actually be able to have a separate workspace for each machine and, and even run them simultaneously off of one computer. Um, so I don't know if that is of a benefit to you at this point, um, but there will be a, an additional like work, workspace setup step that will, that will happen. But when you're transitioning to a new, uh, oh, well, the other thing is you'll probably wanna go ahead and write down all of your um, measurements. You will have to recalibrate your machine, but if you have good measurements for your offset and your distance between motors, you'll be able to just copy, write those down and then, and then use those. Um, and the new version of Makerverse, because of the updated firmware, has a little bit more uh, in-depth guided calibration process that doesn't really, it doesn't, we're, we're eliminating the need for you to cut the, the big square. I see you have the, the, the bow tie from, so do you have an upgrade kit? Is yours, did you upgrade from an original Maslow? Yeah, me? Yeah, yeah. all right. Okay, perfect. Now I saw your I saw your bow tie on your wasteboard. Now I, I was like, oh, okay, so it'll be similar to that, but it yeah. won't actually cut the bow tie itself. It'll just go to the corners, and it'll make it'll just drill a hole, um, and then you'll you'll do some some measuring there. So we're we're definitely excited to get that out to everybody. Uh, we just want to make sure that we we properly go through the test iterations with. Yeah. Uh, Chris, uh, this is Dale. If Drew and I have three Maslows running right now. If we could get a copy of that as well, I'd love to test that multi uh, Maslow deal. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think three so far has been the maximum that we've run off of one laptop. Um, but but then, yeah, you would definitely be able to get it to where you could run multiple things um, simultaneously within one. That sucks because I was gonna buy like ten more Maslows. Well, no, that's fine. I'm just, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. You just need one copy of Makerverse. Uh, yeah, I'm just joking. But hey, we, um, oh, sorry. That's a good question, Dale. Yeah, so I will, uh, Dale, I'll send you my email as well so we can get you set up on that. Um, Jesse, did you have any other questions on your situation? No, that, that's it. I mean, it's, it's working great. I got it calibrated pretty much dead on. I mean, I'm cutting a giant 46 inch circle now and I wasn't a couple of days ago able to spin it because they were longer than or wider than taller or taller than wider. But, but I mean, it's, it's going well. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. Well, I will get with you on that uh, and we'll get you, we'll get you all set up. Um, Thank you. Do we have anyone else today? I've got a quick question. Uh, sure. So, uh, Dale, Dale and I's background. Uh, so, I said a CTO for one of the scooter companies that y'all have probably heard of. Uh, I'll leave it unnamed right now. But, uh, but and Dale said as a director of innovation. Um, so, we spent a lot of time. Uh, we spent a lot of time in Shenzhen sourcing stuff or anything else. But I noticed the last couple of packages you know, we had got shipped were coming from Shenzhen. Yes. And so is all your supplies right now still coming out of Shenzhen? So if we were to order stuff, is it going to come out of Shenzhen? Are you keeping any stocks here in the U.S. for distribution? So we do keep a stock in the U.S. for distribution. Um, if we have it, because we use ocean freight, um, to obviously to keep our, our overhead down as much as possible. Um, so if we, ever, if we ever have an instance where we are stocked out in the U.S., um, then we'll just direct ship from our factory. Um, and then that's, that's when you, you would see a package coming directly from Shenzhen. But yeah. we have, um, we have some, so I think there's, 
like Monday where we're, we're going to be restocked. So we'll have, we'll have some stuff in house again. They, they were pretty quick. This last order I got was quick. So I bought a full kit and then I bought an upgrade kit. Um, I have a bunch of extra parts. Um, the one thing, there's some few pieces you don't have me all stored. Like, uh, Try, sorry, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, but if there's some things I wanted to buy, just some individual components that weren't listed, like on the store, like I have the motors, uh, I think I have the motor mouse. I, I can't remember what it was off the top of my head, but there's a few parts that I, could, I don't think I could find that I was to see about getting from y'all. Yeah. I know. Okay. I just email y'all about those. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, we do some one off stuff. What we'll yeah. probably do is just run it through like a warranty purchase. Um, yeah. that's, that's how we have like a lot of our individual parts um, listed. Um, but, but we do, we do have a way where if you have some like onesie twosie stuff that you want to buy to like piece another kit together, um, we can, we can definitely facilitate that. And then if we do custom sled stuff, like do y'all have people doing custom accessories for y'all's thing? I guess, sorry, last question on this. Do y'all have, um, cause we, I, I, I've been laser cutting. We have a bunch of laser cutters, 130 watt, 140 watt laser cutters. Yeah. And I was saying, yeah. and, um, we were, I laser cut some sleds, some of the M2 sleds out of like a nice thick acrylic. And, um, and then we've been doing, I built some of the box. Sorry, I'm on a, I'm on using a, one of the Facebook portals right now. So it's like, oh, nice. <laughs> it's kind of, it makes it easy for some of the video calls, but, uh, but I, so I like what I did for the blocks and stuff like that. We did, um, it's, I, we just powder coated, uh, took some steel block we cut up and then just powder coated it instead of using bricks. And I wasn't actually like, you know, consolidated to make it a little bit smaller, but we were thinking about doing some custom parts. Uh, is that something I'll allow for? Like if we were to work oh, yeah. with you? 100%. This is like exactly what our marketplace um, yeah. was designed for. That's what so, I was going to say too, Chris. Go ahead. Yeah. So you can actually sign up to be a vendor. It's very similar to like if you were doing like an Etsy store, um, but it's housed on the MakerMade website. And Perfect. then you can upload your own products there and then they become visible like on our store. And then, so we handle all of the transaction and then you get, obviously you get your money um, through us, but you don't have to handle any of the credit card stuff. And then you would just be notified that someone has ordered some of your custom pieces and then you you fulfill the order with the customer. That's perfect. Yeah, so y'all's marketplace, I like it. Cause I'm, I have Glowforge, we have all kinds of stuff. I mean, we have, I want to get one of those 3D printers. We have about 30, 40 3D printers, but um, I want to, one of these days, I want to, I really like those products, but uh, I saw the marketplace. I just didn't realize they were doing physical products too. Uh, if that was just design. So that's awesome. And we don't charge a fee. We don't take a cut of your sale. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. What? Cool. Crazy. Yeah. So we, Dale, there you go. That's what we got. We got, we got to get some of these things put up. We got to get busy. Here, I will drop a link to how to become a vendor in the chat. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And I think, uh, Dale, you have my email. If you could send me some information, I will, I will buy the first set of those <laughs> replacements. All right. We, uh, I just emailed you for the other topic. Um, I'll just, I'll just append to that. And, um, so Drew and I are CC'd on it. And we have another going with other Drew, um, for the uh, reseller and calibration assistance uh, conversation. So I'll just put that all together. Perfect. I think I found y'all's color blue too. So I tried to make everything, we're trying to do everything blue so it looks really good. And I've been putting the logos on y'all stuff. So like, uh, I'm trying to, anyway, so yeah, I'll, I'll see y'all I'll some powder coated blocks and metal blocks instead of bricks. Awesome. No, that'd be, that'd be great. Looking forward to it. Um, Another thing that, oh, uh, Drew, is that Drew? Did I pronounce that right? Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's you? Yeah, yeah, okay, sorry. I've got, I've got the, the camera part maximized. So like all the other stuff is, is hidden. So a lot of times I can see people, but I don't know who, who I'm talking to. So I apologize. Um, another thing that may work for you um, just, just given your environment and how many machines that you have, uh, we have a Raspberry Pi image of Makerverse available as well. Oh, hell yes. Now you just made my day actually, cause that's what, so we're both, Dale and I are both network engineers and, uh, data center engineers by trade. He was actually, he was actually the one that managed YouTube servers for the first couple of years before Google bought YouTube. So. That's like makes a day. We've got tons of pies. We've got tons of everything else here. So that would be awesome. Absolutely. So 3B plus or a four, um, yep. you can install this image on. 
and then the machine itself will have its own instance of Makerverse running that you can hit over IP using a browser. And then oh, that's can... badass. So are you, are you using like OctoPrint, some of the OctoPrint from it? Because uh, so it's really cool. Like, um, have you seen played with Lightburn at all for the lasers? Lightburn, yeah. So I, I when y'all the camera function too, I was when I, I saw the camera function in there, I was wondering if y'all doing like light burn where you're using a wide angle camera and you can have it line up and calibrate based on that, like you can do with light burn or like with a glow forge. Not so much yet, only because in a in a four by eight environment with the the object recognition a, a requires a lot of good lighting at, at, yeah. that, at that distance. Um, so it, it's something that we're looking into, but we can't do it reliably because there's a lot of dependencies on the users, just environment and lighting. Yeah, I don't honestly prefer just staring at it anyway. Yeah, honestly, I don't use I don't use the camera like feature, feature either. I, the thing we use the camera feature for is for interns and stuff with the um, the Glowforge. And besides yeah. that, I took the cameras off the light burn off our big lasers because of that issue. The big thing that we the big reason for the introduction of camera. Uh, in Makerverse uh, was for that Pi image. So if you're using the Pi image and you're managing your machine over the network, you can mount a webcam to the machine and then you can just pull up the IP address on like your cell phone or something if, if you're in another room and you can pull up the camera and watch it kind of like a baby monitor. While the it, that actually saved our ass. I'll tell you, we nearly burned our building down one time. So the Z axis broke and we put the Wise cameras on there and uh, and we walked away and uh and, and we walked and luckily i live like a few minutes down the street from our building but uh what do you call it it literally i, I started looking at the camera I was like man it's foggy in there what's going on i was like oh shit yeah, it was the, uh, <laughs> got it, literally the backboard it, on, on on those on those um uh, frame is that again the, uh, the rigid routers they have that little that little plastic tab that goes into the thing yeah. for the it, it it finally wore away and just fell out and then the whole thing just went full bore straight in and was running the collet into the into the product and it was just smoking. Oh, I've seen it's it's really funny that um, one of the one of the complaints that we have gotten on the original Maslow kits that we were selling was that the router is just capable of destroying so much material that if the machine fails the router just keeps killing stuff and doesn't turn off. And, and yep. like, well, you know, we, we tried to give you the power that everybody wanted. I mean, it's, you're not going to find an X carve that you can do an eighth inch depth pass with a quarter inch bit and then just, just rip and run. I guess I'll take on that. Sorry. <laughs> but, uh, so I have, we, we, I've built a lot of um, CNC mills and stuff like that too. And so I have the speed controller. So I've been looking at swapping these out with, uh, instead of routers, putting in a water chill. So we, we also have a bunch of industrial water chillers doing water chill spindles. Yeah. But they have speed yeah. control. And I saw the new ones. It looks like they have speed control. I honestly haven't had a chance to play with them. Yep. Um, I yep. built them, but I haven't had a chance to play with them. But you do have spindle control now? Yep. So as long as your G-code um, has um, durable 1.1 1 .1, um, spindle controls codes in it, yeah. Um, then it's 100% compatible with the with the M2 board. Now, now easel. If you use easel, I, I think easel has on off. I don't know if it has speed control. You might have to manage. So you you would probably be uh, needing to use like a Fusion 360 post processor to add um, PWM like speed control. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we're huge fans. We absolutely love. We we think y'all have done an amazing job. Super impressed with y'all. So, you have evangelists by far. Well, I I definitely appreciate it. And what we uh, at, at some point when when travel and hanging out with people is widely accepted, we'll 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 have to come down and check you guys out. Yeah, that'd be awesome. We've got twenty two thousand square feet of basically. Toys. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty much. Just, our wives finally got pissed of, every, of us having everything at the houses, so they've made us get a building. There you go. <laughs> Let's see. I hey, could I uh, could I yeah. ask uh, one last remedial question, just to follow up from before? Um, and I, I think it was uh, I couldn't I couldn't see very well when someone was helping with this question, but this notion of configuring the USB port is the thought that on the Mac, um, the USB port isn't 
providing enough power for the device if it's not plugged in or is it that it's the port is sleeping somehow um, with power saving? Yes. So the, the Mac operating system prides themselves on being smarter than anyone and knowing what you want before you want it. Um, and so they're notorious for just turning the USB port off randomly. And so if you have like, like mine, it does it all the time on flash drives. Like if I use a flash drive and I plug it in and then I unplug it and then I come back to the machine and I plug it in, it's almost like there's a set amount of dwell time that has to occur before it lets you use the USB port again. Mm. Um, and so that power save feature is what kind of turns that smarts off to that USB port and it makes it just act like a regular USB port. Because so Yeah. So the same setting that, uh where you prevent the computer generally from sleeping automatically yes yeah. is the one that would control that because I, I couldn't find a usb port specific setting anywhere um, yeah, it should and say, it, under the power settings it should mention peripherals um and then that's that's usb ports will be under kind of that that blanket verbiage hmm, i just see put hard disks to sleep, but I don't see, and displays, I don't see it talking about peripherals under energy saver. And when I go specifically to like the device, it sounds like that wouldn't be the place. I didn't see anything there. What uh, OS X version are you on? Might be uh, it is uh, Catalina 10.15.6. Okay. Depending on the version, sometimes it's uh, command line based. Cut right here. There you go. Uh, yeah, good luck. It's pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> it's fine. Just mute it. Just mute it. Okay. I'm, I'm looking through, I'm on the Apple site right now. Oh, thank you, I appreciate that. Because that, that would explain a lot about the intermittency of the challenge I've had just getting it to reproduce the same behavior. And I'd really rather not buy another laptop just to avoid that. Oh, okay. So there's a display sleep and then a computer sleep option. And you want the computer sleep to be never, but you can have display sleep to whatever you like. Okay, so the only thing that I have that looks like that is prevent computer from sleeping automatically when the display is off. Correct. Yes. That is the one you want. Okay, and so, um, as long as I prevent the computer from sleeping, the display can still turn off after a while, but the computer's not sleeping, so the port will stay on. Correct. So you won't get any burn in or anything on your on your screen, but yeah. it won't, it won't turn off like um, your USB or any other hardline connections that you have. Okay, awesome. And that you found sounds like uh, guys at Canopen, Canopen, you found that that neutralizes the biggest negative to using a Mac, correct? Well, we don't use a Mac for our machine, but I just know from experience on other uh, devices and other things that I've worked with that uh, with my Mac that that is an issue. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. Awesome. Um, well, I, uh, I guess in the same spirit that we were talking about before, that might be a good uh, addition to the notes. I, I'd imagine that there are enough people using 
max that uh, there'd at least be some others that would be affected by that into the instructions as a watch out. I imagine so. I'm really looking forward to this Pi thing he's talking about now. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that is definitely um, pretty helpful. Um, then, then it allows you to control your machines on an iPad or your cell phone or any other, any other you know, web-enabled um, device. And um, then as we move forward into that progression, that's, that's where we're, we're even looking at the feasibility of just adding a touchscreen to the Pi itself. And then you have like a standalone control box with a touchscreen environment, but we're, we're still. If you want to talk to us about that. So we, so I designed my background is uh, electrical engineering and uh, designing. I do a lot of flight controllers and uh, I've designed a lot of touchscreen interface devices on the Pi. Um, like kiosks, like you'd have over it. Like if you go to Olive Garden or whatever the restaurants where they have the little kiosks you touch screen and play games on. Oh, the Zios. Yes. So I've designed some for like that for clients. They've done so, and there's some great open source stuff out there that'd be beautiful that your community would love. Yeah. No. We're and we're definitely looking at um, all of our options. Um, so what we have done, uh, just because uh, Oct OctoPrint is a, an amazing tool, um, but given that it is open source at any moment, they could decide they hate us and tell us that we're not allowed to use it for our stuff. Um, so we, have, we have our own node backend uh, as well as Python, Python <laughs> that we're running to, to enable and power all of our stuff. Um, and, <laughs> our, uh, <laughs> and then our, our UI is, a, is just an electrode uh, react based envi UI environment. Um, which which gives us that responsiveness for different displays and whatnot. So definitely uh, excited about the Pi. And the Pi image has been available for a couple months now, but we just haven't really done a great job of promoting it. So apologies there if if it was of interest to you when we originally released it and you didn't know about it. Honestly, I haven't had a chance to keep up with this much. Dale's been the one um, really keeping up with the mass house. Uh, I, I haven't had a chance. I just, it's funny because I actually got the first one we got, I asked for for Father's Day for my wife. She's like, what do you want? I was like, I, I was like, I've been wanting a mass house so bad. So that the first one we got was from that. But um, I still have, I've built them, but I still haven't had a chance to actually play with them much. So I, I'm looking forward to playing with it more now. Nice. But yeah. Anything you guys need on the pie? Um, so what we have is a full image available. Um, so it, it's not like the Makerverse application that you need to install on, on, your, on your Debian. It's, it's, a, it's the actual image. So you just, just rip it to a, uh, an SD card and, and, and you're good to rock and roll. So is it, is it based on the Debian or is it based on the Raspbian? Uh, it's, it's a Debian install. Okay, perfect, okay, cool. Cool. Uh, anybody else have anything? I think I don't think we've seen anybody new. Um, I don't think so either, Chris. But this has been great. Yeah, no, I think this is um, a better turnout for the first one than I was expecting. Just, just because of the timeline of when we put the information out. But so for anyone still on, um, this will be, this is a reoccurring thing every Thursday. So if it's, it can be a, a questions, a sharing what you've got going on, or just, you know, if you're bored and want to hear other people talk, feel free to join. <laughs> I'm gonna start making our interns join, and um, that way they can just—I'll just make them mute, but stay muted, but just so they can listen in and hear what the community's talking about. Okay, no, that's great. And and what I'll do, I think what I've kind of planned is, if if we have a week where there's no one asking like any questions, I'll probably do just like random like demos of what we have, like like I've got a 10 watt diode laser running on my M2. 
um, and maybe go through just showing like how I set that up and how it works because that's just a native function of the M2 control board. Funny, that's actually, I have a 40 watt laser I pulled out of a K40 and stripped apart a K40. And I was actually about to use the, uh, I built a frame as I put it on the mat cell for fun. I was gonna actually make a mount, I was on the, the, put this 40 watt laser pointing straight down. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, I just gotta figure out how, that was one of my weekend board projects, but that's really cool. Where's the gantry? It's up there. Yeah, so there's a, there's a laser um, power control on the on the board i think it's the last two pins on the on the green header there um and then and then that'll give you the ability to to provide power to a control board so i'm running a oh what do i have i have a jtex 7 watt and then i have a endurance 10 watt um, and both of those have standalone control um, but we're able to send um, PWM commands uh, to, to those um, lasers so we can actually do full raster and not just on off engraving uh, with the M2. That, sorry. And that's on the uh, original too, right? The, um, so the original, we can, you can hook a laser up to it, but uh, using like the, the Z control, but you can only do a... Uh, power on or power off. So you'll just have, you oh, just right. have black line control. Um, but we do have PWM control with uh, the M2 control board. So so if you've got like an upgrade kit or an M2, then then you have the ability to do um, laser control uh, and, and, and raster like scan lines um, using that. Uh, and uh, Makerverse, um, there is the laser widget there. So it actually knows how to properly interpret the M codes from your your laser G code, and it, it routes them through the controller pro uh, properly. Hey, so um, that brings up a question. So could we have the laser and the spindle on there, and then just measure the offset, and then use the workspace offsets to say center the laser? You would, but you would just need to cut another hole in the sled. Yeah. Off off to the side and then adjust the, the distance. Absolutely. The, the focal length that we're, the focal distance that we're getting on our diode lasers right now is about five millimeters. And I want to say a 60 watt CO2 is like 14 millimeters. Um, so it wouldn't be that hard to, to fashion amount. Um, it, it would just be up to you to, to do the offset math if you wanted to run both of them on the machine at the same time. It looks like they're sharing an idea. My uh, rooster's hungry too. So, uh, so um, what do you got to say? I was, I was just, uh, yeah, that's awesome. I'm trying to get Dale to let y'all go. So before y'all, <laughs> before he comes up with a thousand. No, no, that's what this is for. Uh, the plan was just keep the bridge open, field any questions, have any conversations. Cause you know, I, because it was a pre-planned starting and end time, if, if I close it now, someone will jump on it like 1221 and be like, hey, man, you lied to me. And so so I'm, I'm here. So we can awkwardly just stare at each other or we can just have conversation and wait for someone to join. Yeah, I think it'd be good. I'll get the. Uh, yeah. Uh, I don't have any other. I have I have a ton of other questions, but um, it's right now. I think that's the main things I got. Yeah. I guess uh, I guess. One, seriously, um, he's. Uh, I guess one other thing, quick. Uh, so I, I didn't want to switch. I, I had already built the uh, the M1 backboards or the M1 frames where, and we'd put them on casters and stuff. And I kind of like the style of them. So I built the M2s on the M1 backboards, but that's not going to make any difference. I looked at all the measurements; everything seemed the exact same, right? Absolutely. The only thing that the M2 came with was the wall mounts in the event that you wanted to wall mount your machine. But it uses all of the same angles and dimensions. Perfect. The plastic frame and i actually have one of one of my machines is on the is on the m1 frame uh with casters as well uh, oh. is, how, how is there any way we can get svgs of the sled yeah yeah i think those are on peyton already dropped off but i i believe those are on you want the m2 sled or the m1 sled 
them too sled. I was trying to find the SVGs and I couldn't find them. So, because um, one of the th one of the pieces came in, the little clear piece that covers it, the sled was broken when it came in. On uh, my package, it just got the package had gotten beat up by the shipping. So I just laser cut a new one, but I was trying to find this SVG so I could just laser cut a new clear piece. And I was like, ah, crap, I couldn't find them. So I'll look again and see. I can I can probably get you an SVG for the acrylic piece if that. I got I got made. I just measured it and just made it. Okay, we do so, have we do have the SVG for the sled though. Um, because the upgrade kits um, don't normally come with a sled and, and people cut their own. So I yeah. do know that that file exists. And I think I have a job already in easel that uses an eighth inch bit. If you want, I can just share the easel project that has the, the sled already with all the pockets and everything set up. Yeah, uh, I was gonna start. I was gonna laser cut some out of um, three quarter inch oh. thick acrylic and do, and do some. I was gonna do a clear one with LEDs. So people yeah, see. No, so I have to do a completely clear slide for y'all. That'd be cool. Yeah, I'll yeah. get you. The, I'll get you the SVG. Um, cool. That'd be awesome. Yeah, because I, I I couldn't find it, but yeah, I'll, I'll laser cut when I send you the blocks. Um, I'll also send you the uh, a uh, a clear sled. I'll make you a completely clear sled. Okay. No, that'd be awesome. Um, and yeah. <laughs> Definitely, definitely interested um, in seeing what you guys think of the pie image. Um, that's gonna that's gonna evolve over time uh, as well, just to be a little more capable. Um, and then we're going to make just like an actual mobile app that is going to be the a web controller for the pie. So you'd have like a a native Android or iOS or iPad application that is the UI that just uses um, web sockets to talk to the pie. Are y'all doing y'all's dev over in China with the Osaber guys at Shenzhen? No, no, it's me. I'm, oh, a, so I'm, a, I'm a software engineer. Um, so all, all, the, all the software and firmware stuff is, is done uh, in the States here with our team. Uh, that's awesome because I, I, I had to fly eight of our devs over to Shenzhen for the scooters, for the GPS, because the firmware was so bad. It was like a nightmare. I was like, oh, uh, I forget who we were using that point. But anyway, so yeah, it was kind of interesting. Omni. Um, I mean, yeah. It was, it was like quick crap shoot. You guys should just be like the rooster labs. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one that got roosters. I have. Uh, 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 it's a long story, but anyway, it's they're kind of. Fun. I got a couple of goats, and then there was little roosters, and I got Drew a rooster. I'm sorry. Yeah. Hey, we can say uh, this is kind of politically incorrect, but I know there's a news story about some guy that got in trouble for on Zoom. I'm like, what? I've had my cock out on Zoom several times. <laughs> sorry, dirty joke, but. There you go. <laughs> and, So it's just us and Jesse and Chris? Yep, it appears to be that. And we lost everybody. I guess one, is there a good weight, a good weight? I found a, a good, um, like the bricks is like five pounds, good weight for the brick, or, cause I know some bricks are lighter than others, or does it not really matter the way as long as it's at least like four or five pounds to kind of keep the sled down? So what we have found is that a total sled weight with the router and your weights being between 23 and 28 pounds of total sled weight. Is so, how much, so how much would that be with the bricks within like, um, so 10 pounds of bricks, two, two five pound bricks each? Just average the sled. The sled I don't know. Yeah, I, I guess I'll weigh it on. I'll okay. weigh it on. I'll, I'll, I'll make the blocks to make that. So 23 pounds, you said? Yeah, between 23 and 28. Some people run closer to 30, but we, we have just found for like the average user, um, yeah. being, being between like that 23 and 25 pounds is, is a good, like all round, uh, sled weight for multiple different, you know, material types. So I'll measure the sled with the, I'll measure, I'll weigh the sled with the, uh, with the, for the M2 with the rigid, and then I'll make weights for, I'll just keep it right around 25. So that way I'll make the weight. So it mount, they, well, the rigid is probably the heaviest of all of them, right? Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. I think I'm running four pound bricks with my, I think with my, with my DeWalt 611, I'm running right around like 23 pounds. And then when I put the rigid on there, 
I'm, I'm right around like 26. Okay. Yeah. So I cut, I cut five pound blocks of steel. Yeah. Yeah. I so, think I'm running like four pound bricks. Yeah. And, perfect. You know, obviously like I didn't go to Home Depot and be like, Hey, I need four pound bricks. That's just kind of like what they ended up being when I bought them. Yeah. Um, but it's like those regular, like red, like paver bricks that are like, yeah. Green. We're, we actually back up to a landfill where they used to dump all the roads. So uh, all the bricks we, we'd been using, I just was literally going in back and grabbing off the out of the back here. Nice. Whatever works. Really cool. I like your your metal cutting thing. I want one of those. I just haven't bought one. The first day I dropped on my foot. So the first day I got to put casters on this thing. I don't know if you can see the casters, but so I put casters on this thing. Yeah, and, I, and one of my wells didn't hold up because I was in a hurry, and it fell over, and that thing's like 800 pounds, and broke my foot in five places, and dented it. I wasn't even worried about that. What, first, what killed me is I just got it. I just uncrated it, and I was so excited. It's a hydraulic band, and I was like super excited. Man. I broke it the first day. I had to rebuild it. So, man, don't put them on casters. Yeah, I want I want one, but I don't I don't do enough metal work to justify it. Not that yeah. I need not that I need an actual justification to buy tools. Yeah, that's our, that's our problem. It's also where we end up having to get a building. Yeah. Very cool. Well, I'm gonna jump back on this stuff. It was really nice meeting y'all. Thank you so much for everything. Hey, no, absolutely. Um, and you got my contact information. Um, anything that we can do um, down the road, definitely let me know. Um, and, you know, we like to take care of everybody. That's okay. awesome. Y'all done an amazing job. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. You have a good one. You too. Thanks. All right. Well, if it's just us, um, I may close this down a little bit earlier um, so that I can get that firmware and software over to you because I think me acting on something for you might be a little more valuable. That's good. Okay. Thank Perfect. you. Well, I'll go ahead and shut this down and then um, just look for a, did you send me an email? I did. Okay. Perfect. So I will just reply and I'll get you um, some, and maybe a Dropbox, Dropbox link because of file size. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank All you. Right. Thank you.